Unfortunately, my Yiddish is somewhat limited, or my Hebrew, I apologize, and so I can only say shalom pretty much. And I'm here to talk a little bit about digital transformation uh, from a Microsoft perspective and share with you what we have been doing and what we have seen across the globe in various areas. Before I start, I want to remind everybody that most of the time when we think about the future, it's kind of already there. Uh, but unevenly distributed, not something that I made up. Mr. Gibson um, provided that quote. But as the uh, professor from Google said, uh, the cloud and other uh, innovations that we have been driving together are really making it easier to distribute that future faster and further. Um, and that trend, I think, will go continue, uh, whereas Mr. Gibson was in a time where a lot of this future was in little labs that took forever to distribute. Um, as we know, cell phones, now AI, and all sorts of other technologies are effectively spreading faster and further uh, than it was imagined even two years ago. I think we're actually really seeing a big acceleration. From our perspective, this acceleration is a combination of innovation waves that we call cloud, effectively a set of data centers around the globe, networks around the globe, for example, we are partnering with Facebook to change the way intercontinental network cables work. Um, as Microsoft, we're investing together with Facebook on network innovation and others. Uh, the person from Facebook talked about their Wi-Fi Express product and some other things. So certainly a lot of things going on to make technology more accessible everywhere you are. The second thing, of course, is IoT, the Internet of Things. And it's really interesting that when you think about the various compute areas. So we had the mainframe, we had PCs, we had minis, we had smartphones. There was always a thing associated with that had a very distinct name. Now we're at a point where we can't even name the thing anymore and have to simply say it's a thing because it could be anything. Um, and it's really fascinating to see what people have come up with from very big machines all the way to disposables. Yes, there are actually pills that you can swallow that will signal whatever they see in your body uh, to a nearby recipient so that the doctor can actually look into uh, areas that they do not want to cut open yet um, and still want to see into your details. Then edge computing, something that's fairly new from an industry phenomenon perspective, but a lot of the innovations that people have associated with cloud, big data, machine learning, deep learning, are now being pushed out into areas where there can be of immediate value in areas like uh, factories or in uh, poor connectivity areas. If you go to India, for example, while there's a lot of connectivity in the cities, the rural areas are clearly not connected, and factories don't necessarily sit where the ur um, urban areas are with great connectivity. But they still need the same kind of capabilities like machine learning and deep learning to optimize the production processes, increase security and safety, and so forth. And then, of course, AI. I'm going to walk you through Microsoft's perspective on some of these things and give you examples. First of all, it's a lot of times about what we call the digital feedback loop. Because now that we are connected, either as people, as things, or as uh, software products, we are effectively collecting a lot of data that allows us to run innovation loops. And these are just two around the product cycle, in terms of how do I make my product better to fit the need that has been effectively identified by the usage of the product. And then how do I get to know my customer better so that I can deliver better customer experiences? And that combination across the lines of the four innovation waves that I mentioned before is really the way we think about cohesively end-to-end -end of how to improve the situation for software developers, for product developers, and bring them together into an innovation loop that hopefully will strengthen each other um, and effectively drive new things that we can see, new products we can deliver, new services we can offer. Let's talk a little bit about cloud. Cloud is becoming a global phenomenon. This is just Microsoft's cloud. Officially, um, the statement that I can make, my legal guys for some reason tell me that I can only talk, we manage a million servers plus. Um, it's a little bit more than that, but we can only talk about a million servers plus over 40 locations across the globe. 
We also manage 1.5 million miles of fiber ourselves. That's the last official number that I've seen. I'm sure it's more than that by now. And really driving a global network of interconnected compute that effectively is available to you wherever you want to be, from China to South Africa to Brazil to the US, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'll continue to look into investments to make that compute and solution capability available everywhere. The other piece that the cloud is driving very, very hard is how do you build better applications? Faster, more efficient, and so forth. Um, it started with IIS. We've talked about PaaS a lot. Now containers being the latest rage in that kind of area. And then serverless computing. Some of you will remember this as Lambda, but uh, Google and Microsoft are talking, talking about this as Azure Functions or Google Functions. So the idea of how do you build functions of code that deliver functionality faster without you having to worry about the infrastructure. Our friends from Domino's have been using Azure Functions to really connect with their audience uh, much, much faster and much, much deeper. Remember that little loops that I said? Domino is using effectively their smartphone application to learn a lot about their very young, or often very young, uh, consumers. And building Azure Functions, or using Azure Functions as a way to really connect fast with those guys without having to worry about technology, infrastructure, and so forth, because Azure Functions effectively take care of that, and we're also uh, improving the cost factor for Domino's as well, because functions have a second or microsecond billing strategies, so that only run, uh, we will only bill you when the code runs. So thinking about how you run code faster, cheaper, and how you connect with your product to your consumers uh, in effectively minimum time. The other piece that we're seeing is there's Still, despite all this connectivity, quite a few scenarios where you cannot connect. I'll give you a very, very prominent example where our friends at Carnival are actually using Azure to build a complex set of solutions, but they still want to run the same solutions with the same infrastructure, same security, same operations model also on their cruise ships, which are effectively large data centers uh, to one degree because of the entertainment and other things that they run. So they use a new technology we're going to make available next month. You can actually order now from HP and others, uh, a technology called Azure Stack, which allows you to pack Azure into a rack and ship it to your data center. In this case, it's a swimming data center from our friends from Carnival. Now switch gears. On top of cloud infrastructure, we are now building into IoT infrastructure. IoT is effectively about things connecting, sending data, driving analytics, and closing the loop by either improving the product or changing the product that you have in the field, changing the temperature, changing the RPMs, and so forth, based upon intelligence that you gather from the data that you collected. And there are a couple of examples that might be really interesting. So in smart buildings, lots of innovation here. Um, the ThyssenKrupp example is really interesting because they have been start doing this work with us for four years. And they started off with very simple, quote-unquote, data science to drive predictive maintenance because any time the elevator is down, they lose money because they're managing these elevators with an uptime uh, SLA. Then now they are thinking about, okay, how do I build my supply chain better? Because I'm sure you have seen this before. When you have a washing machine broken, the repairman shows up, A, he's late or she, and B, he has the wrong parts with him. Saying, ah, got to go back to the shop, get the right part, and come back. Well, with elevators, it's a bit more complicated. And so now they're using predictive maintenance to effectively tell the person who is going to repair it, bring this part, because that's most likely the cause of uh, the repair. Manufacturing, big, big area, obviously, for uh, IoT, has been for a long time, but is now being augmented by cloud ele uh, elements like our friends at Rockwell Automation, they're effectively taking pipeline operations and are looking not just to analyze the data, but drive automated insights. Again, coupling a lot of the data that they already have, the data that they're gathering with machine learning at the first level of models, and of course, down the line with AI to improve the operations of the pipeline. Edge, another scenario that we are seeing uh, becoming very, very prominent. As I said before, if you are common or if you're used to 
cloud application models, call them machine learning, call their uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, or you're running stream analytics using Spark or Storm or something like that, you're used to a very rich ecosystem of solutions that you're using for your IoT solutions. Now, if you operate a factory or you're operating a nuclear submarine or the carnival ship, you can't really run the cloud in the background because of either security, if the factory, um, if you're using uh, your IoT scenario for uh, security reasons, you actually cannot rely on the cloud. So, what do we do? We effectively deploy cloud elements, either as Azure Stack, if you want the full solution, or just as what we call the IoT Edge, to the um, factory, for example, and running the components in containers, uh, Docker containers, that is, down at the factory, but the solution is the same and is automatically connected to the Azure Cloud, so that you can uh, manage the systems, gather the data, and only do what you need at the edge, and the rest continues to run um, in the cloud. This is here an example of a company called Sandvik. Sandvik builds very complex, rich machines. Those machines run up to a million dollars easily because they're very complex. And so we have worked with uh, Sandvik called Cor Coromant, which is their subsidiary to effectively deploy the Azure IoT Edge into a factory managing and monitoring the machines. Starting with streaming analytics, because the guy machine streams data that effectively indicates the health of the system, and then augmenting it with machine learning models that predict when there are issues with the system. And since this is happening in real time, any downtime to that machine is super expensive. Um, we effectively are moving the machine learning capabilities close to the machine rather than having it in the cloud where it might take latency that damages the machines uh, before we can react to it. So this is becoming more real time uh, rather than real enough time as we would do in a normal cloud situation. Then of course AI. And again, all of this is interconnected. There is no AI without cloud. There is no IoT without big data and machine learning and AI. All of that together is really the interesting set of technology trends that really drive the digital transformation that we have been hearing so much about. At the core of AI is effectively the drive to implement something that humans have no issue with doing. For example, if I see my colleague down there that is uh, watching me uh, falling down, that is something that I, as a person, will immediately react to and say, oh, she needs help, let me fall down. A computer with a camera will watch it and say, I have no idea what that is. Something or whatever, an object did something. So you have to teach these things to effectively show emotion to the degree and start to help um, where things go. And we have an announced a whole bunch of interesting technologies like reality as a service and so forth that really do, do object recognition and tell you and can automatically react to things. But at the end of the day, it's around how do I bring capabilities that humans do already natively to computers and support the humans. One thing that our CEO Satya has suggested and recommended and I see it now finally being taken up is 10 rules for AI, because AI has super powerful potentials, but as Spider-Man would say, um, with great power comes great responsibility, um, and I do believe that talking about rules for AI um, is something that we need to think about as well as the power of AI, and thinking through as a society and as the world economy, how do we use this? How do we use it for good, um, and how do we use it so that it's responsibly driven? With that, I want to thank you. I'm going to show you a video when I go out down here. We do this TED style, so at the end of the day, um, I hope this gave you a rough overview. They gave me 15 minutes and I am going to be in time uh, rather than the other crowd before me. Um, but I do appreciate you listening and spending the time with me and enjoy the rest of the conference.